part of the Press Play Podcast Network. Look up in the sky, it's a bird, it's a plane, it's... This is Jason J. Lewis, the voice of Superman on Justice League Action. This is Mark Wade, writer of Superman Birdwine. You're listening to The Krypton Report. Welcome to the Krypton Report. I am your host, Tyler, the Superman of Blue, the Man of Tomorrow. And with me today is going, hopefully, to be James, because technical problems. I'm using my remote studio because of technical issues. And we have a special guest. You could say he is like hmm, the Superman of Earth. Hmm, I don't know. I can't remember all the designers, but, you know, we'll say Earth, too. Mr. Anthony Desiato from Digging for Kryptonite. Welcome. Thank you for having me back. I appreciate it. I didn't know where you were going with the Earth designation. I thought maybe we were going to go with, what was it, 167 is Smallville's Earth in the Arrowverse? But I was trying to, I was trying to go with uh, Kingdom Come, but then I blanked on what that official Earth number was supposed to be. Oh, so I was it, like... oh. You know what? I'm not positive either. I was going to say 38, but I don't know if that's right. Because when they did that whole Grant Morrison did that whole like multiversity years ago, they had that map that was like book that told you. But anyways, welcome, man. How's it going? It's going well. Thank you for having me. Thank you for this opportunity to to talk about what we're going to discuss. Another of the lost projects in the Superman canon. This is one that's it's hard to talk about because. There's so much muddle and muddy in what with this. And if everyone's like, what are you guys talking about? Well, <clears throat> we're talking about the film script that was written by J.J. Abrams. That was project working title was Flyby. And then eventually that's just kind of what it's been grouped and known by. That wasn't supposed to be the official title of the project. But it's the film that got the most traction and was going to be produced, but then ended up, oh, but basically ended up becoming Superman Returns. And I think that's the craziest part about all this is when you get into the the meat, so to speak, of this this project and just what happened. I mean, it's it's something now. I, we, we we talked about the death of Superman lives. Um, we talked about that project being the most formed Superman project before this one. And then this one actually gained a lot of traction because they had casting. They had um, directors attached. They had costumes being built. And I think if I remember right, when I first learned of this was years later when I saw the costume that was being molded and formed and said for J.J. Abrams, Superman flyby. Now, at the time, I didn't realize it was J.J. Abrams just writing. Um, and then I, then I started digging into what it was. But when did you first learn about this project? Oh, man, you know, that's a good question. I'm not positive. I want to say it was probably in an issue of Wizard Magazine. I miss Wizard. As do I. It... It, it went downhill, I think it's fair to say, in its in its final years. But uh, for a time, man, I, 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 I was totally on board with Wizard. And especially in the days, even though the internet existed, but, you know, you didn't have the level of uh, coverage of the comics industry or as much of an opportunity to have conversations about what was going on in comics. So to have something like Wizard was really cool. I, I definitely look back on it fondly, especially Wizard at its best. But yeah, if I'm thinking back, it was probably in Wizard where I learned about it. And I got to give a shout out. I'm sure we'll, we'll mention this, but I want to give a shout out to Newverse Creative because through them, I was able to actually hear the J.J. Abrams screenplay brought to life. So Newverse Creative, it's N-E-U, Newverse Creative, and they're on all the major podcast platforms and on YouTube. And they do audio dramatizations of these unproduced screenplays. And they first came on my radar when I was covering the Tim Burton, Nick Cage, Superman Lives movie on Digging for Kryptonite, and they did versions of both the Dan Gilroy and Kevin Smith screenplays. And it's it's a great way to get a feel for this because, mm -hmm. no, you're not seeing it. 
theater of the mind and all that, but at least you're hearing you're hearing the dialogue and the music and the sound effects. And I think they do a really great job of bringing it to life. And that's the primary way that I experienced Superman flyby was by listening to their audio dramatization of that. So it was, it's, it's a great, it's a great thing to have out there. I really love it. Oh, I, I totally agree because um, I always hated like when you'd be like, Oh, the script, the script leaked and you'd find it. And then like, you'd find out it's a bogus script. So you just wasted all this time and it was like some fanfic script and you're like, oh man, but so to, I listened to it as well. And what's fascinating is there's actually two drafts of JJ Abrams script. And the first one leaked years ago when it was in um, pre-production, all that and got a lot of negative feedback, which we'll get into. And then, you know, in the process of this, uh, project it was supposed to be the script was supposed to be turned over to somebody else to do a rewrite on it but i guess that never happened like i never got a full rewrite draft so i'm gonna try to give some history and context about this um and we'll go from there okay turning in his script in july of 2002 jj abrams superman flyby was an origin story okay and brett ratner was hired to direct in september of 02 he originally expressed interest in casting an unknown lead. Um, filming was supposed to start in 2003. Uh, Josh Hartnett was one that was approached. Uh, we'll get into all the casting people. But at one point, Chris, Christopher Walken for Perry White. Um, I'm trying not to give too much away <laughs> because I have all these convoluted notes here. But some other people that had... Met for it was Brendan Fraser, Jerry O'Connell, James Marsden, even Ashton Kutcher was at one time approached David Boreanaz. But Ratner dropped out in March of 2003 and McGee came on. McGee was attached for a while. And then basically <laughs> to shorten it up is this, the production changes hands between McGee, Brett Ratner, back and forth on who's directing, who's not directing. At one time, they both thought they were hired to direct. And then eventually, Brian Singer comes in and takes and changes everything. I mean, it is really, really confusing. It's really convoluted. Much like, you know, when we talked about The Death of Superman Lives and we looked at how you have these people doing these projects, but they were each working on the three different script versions. You know, you had the, the Kevin Smith to the Wesley Strick to the uh, Dan Gilroy here we have director director and they're crossing paths and they wanted to shoot in Australia but the th it goes that McG couldn't he had a fear of flying so he wanted to shoot in uh, Toronto and it's just a bizarre situation so I'm not trying to get too bogged down on production but just to say that Production was all over the place. They, there was all kinds of rumors for Lois Lane, but there was never really a front runner uh, for Lois. And uh, one of the front runners who was looking at for Lex was Robert Downey Jr., which is fascinating. What? I think, I think he's joining us. Hold on, ladies and gentlemen. Hold your breath. J James, are you there? James, I see you. Are you are you with us? Have you joined us in Krypton? And he's gone. And just he's like gone, that. just like that. Death of Superman. We will miss you. Um. So, all this to say, like it, it's a fascinating. Like we don't, I don't have the note taking ability to break down the production side of who was involved with what, when, but we do know they worked on making a suit. Um, the suit artwork will appear on the artwork for this episode. The suit looked, it looked pretty good. Mm -hmm. um, it didn't have trunks. I just want, I want to point that out here. We're in early two thousands. It didn't have trunks. Now with the Robert Downey Jr. Casting, one of the biggest things I've read people talking about was they're glad that this movie didn't get made because had it got made, 
it could have really destroyed the careers of J.J. Abrams, where he ends up, Robert Downey Jr., <laughs> where he ends up, and some others. So it's very, very fascinating. Um, yeah, for sure. And on the Robert Downey Jr. front, you know, listening to the audio dramatization, but before I had done more research on this unmade project, I'm listening to the audio play and I'm thinking to myself, man, Alex sounds a lot like Robert Downey Jr. <laughs> and then, of course, doing more research and said, oh, OK, you know, that that totally tracks. And and I appreciate the attempt to have the uh, the actor portraying Lex in the audio play. Uh, sound like Robert Downey Jr. Because it definitely gives you a feel for what a Robert Downey Jr. Lex Luthor would be. That's yeah. you, by the way, that beeping, correct? Yeah, it's, it's, it's James trying to reach out. <laughs> I figured, yeah. but I was like, oh, no, I hope I don't have anything going off on my computer. No, I remember how long. Poor James had all kinds of technical issues. He might be using his heat vision. Um, so I, I don't know. Poor guy. This is the fun. Wait, maybe now. Maybe. Please, James, we we need you. You're our only hope. Um, so we're going to get into the script, and we'll kind of plug a little bit of production as we go of who and what, but I highly recommend everyone. I'll post this with my show notes, this documentary I found on uh, YouTube that really broke down more of the production stuff. Was this the ten minute one or the hour one? Because I it's the hour it, one. The hour one. Okay, I, I watched the ten minute one. I didn't the, watch the hour long one. But the I'm ten sure minute one's great. It's great, but the hour one was fascinating. It really broke down to which director was involved with what, where, and then the last part of it actually gives you a summary of the of the script. I'll just say, you know, you mentioned some of the feedback that you read online. I, I guess ultimately, I fall into the camp of. I'm not heartbroken that this movie wasn't made. It is fascinating when you look at this and Superman lives and just the totality of the development hell that the Superman feature film was in for all of those years leading up to Superman returns. And what's funny is, and again, I talked about Superman lives on digging for kryptonite and you and I also talked about it here on Krypton report that with both Superman lives and flyby, you know, you had these attempts to reinvent the franchise and what you ended up getting. And I am a fan ultimately of Superman returns, but Superman returns was such a, you know, reverent classic take <laughs> meant to evoke the Christopher Reeve movie. So for all of these attempts to do something different, we actually ended up getting something very traditional for better or worse. Uh, again, for me, I, I would ultimately land in the camp of for better because I've really come around on Superman returns in a lot of ways. But I will say that, having spent a lot of time now with Superman lives watching the documentary and listening to the audio plays of two different versions of the screenplay and listening to Kevin Smith talk about it for years and all that. Yeah. I do think there's this misconception with Superman lives that it would have been such a departure from traditional Superman stories. And I think the casting of Nick Cage would have definitely given it a far more different and offbeat vibe. But in terms of the story that was being told, I, I don't think it's, it's as non-traditional as people might think. Whereas <laughs> listening to the flyby story, and I, I had known the broad strokes of flyby before I, I went into this prep, but you know, there's at least one, a few others, but I think at least one major, major a radical departure from established Superman canon. So when you look at these projects, again, I think if people look at the Tim Burton Nick Cage, it's like, oh, that would have been so out there. I don't know. Check out Flyby because that that one really, really took some liberties. We're going to press pause and hear a few words from our other podcasts on Press Play Podcast Network. Hello, Brooks here with the Books with Brooks monthly book club podcast. Here's how Books with Brooks works. We read one book a month and then we talk about it. Classics like Stephen King's The Shining, debut novels like We Are the Brennans by Tracy Lang, and tons of other compelling, life-changing stories, one book and one month at a time. So come read along with us and then listen in. If you are like Tyler and James and can't get enough super talk, 
Check out these other podcasts. Digging for Kryptonite, Supergirl Radio, The Last Sons of Krypton, The Superboy Legacy Podcast, All-Star Superfans, Superman the Animated Podcast, The Aspiring Kryptonians, Always Hold On to Smallville, The Geek of Steel, and Truth, Justice, and Hope. Remember to check out Krypton Report on all social media platforms. Go to linktree.com slash Krypton Report. you find out all of our information. One dollar a month, you'll get extra special content that you don't get on the main show, like movie commentaries and whatever else comes out of our mouths. So check it out, patreon.com slash Krypton Report. This is Dan Jurgens, and if you want to have a good time, keep listening to the Krypton Report. You talk about departure, and I, I think I've said this before when you and I have recorded on different things. When you watch a film, you know, most films in itself are Elseworlds tales. But when you watch a movie, you want it to be the purest, best representation of your character so that if someone were to say, who is Superman or what is Superman, you can kind of point to that film or that story and be like, that, that's it. You don't want your movie to be a take or a else world's departure. With that being said, I wanted to beat you to that. Um, <laughs> I think Flyby would be a fascinating else world comic or um, animated movie, but for an actual Superman film on screen, I am very happy that this didn't get made because I, I am. I don't mind some changes, some differences. I don't mind additional new characters, but I don't like stuff that doesn't make sense. Or when you say, hey, I want to write this story, but everything you're putting in the story is not true to the character or true to what it is. So uh, that's just how I feel about this. Yes, I'm with you. So the big thing that we, we've been dancing around, uh, would you like to lay it out? Would you like me to? Shall we Shall we dive in? <laughs> I will lay it out. Um, and this is... Uh, so trying to do the summary of this was hard without giving details, but here we go. The script is an origin story that included Krypton in a civil war between Jor-El and his corrupt brother, Katazor. Before Katazor sentences jor to prison, kal is launched to Earth to fulfill a prophecy. Adopted by Jonathan and Martha Kent, he forms a romance with Lois Lane in the Daily Planet. However, Lois is more concerned with exposing Lex Luthor, written as a government agent obsessed with UFO. Clark reveals himself to the world as Superman, bringing Katazor's son, Tizor, and three other Kryptonians to Earth. Superman is defeated and killed and visits Jarrell, who committed suicide on Krypton while in prison. In Krypton, in Krypton, Kryptonian heaven, uh, he resurrects Kal-El, who returns to Earth to defeat the four Kryptonians while the script ends with Superman leaving on a cliffhanger back to Krypton. Yeah, everything I just said was crap. <laughs> like, straight up garbage. And I'm sorry, JJ, like, I I think that the radio drama pulled more from the second script um, because there are some slight changes. But first of all, I don't like the idea that he's Prince Kal-El at all. I don't like that he's Kryptonian royalty. Because I'm not a fan of, like, the concept of, like, the one, like, the chosen one all the time. You know, that was one of my problems that I didn't like about in The Amazing Spider-Man, where mm-hmm. only Peter could have been Spider-Man because of his DNA. I don't like that at all. And I like the idea that Jarrell was just a scientist. He wasn't, he had a, a mark of, you know, grandeur, but at the same time, he wasn't the ruler, you know, and he saved his son. Second of all, the fact that Krypton doesn't blow up diminishes so many elements of what the point of the Superman story is. It takes away the, you know, the Moses messianic, you know, type prophecy side. It takes away so much of what builds his character and what drives the story. Um, 
forcing a new character to be his brother, Katazor. No, like that, that makes me mad. He has a brother. If you want to, you could write a really good, you know, something between the two brothers that are fighting. Fine. But you create Tizor. Now, Tizor could be a cool new character if he's kind of in the vein of just being some Kryptonian soldier. Once we're not, you know, kind of like, I don't, like I said, like, you know, they, they do little things on TV, like in Superman Lois, introducing Tao Ro. That was fascinating. But once again, if you look at that idea of like the perfection of just that one singular movie story, um, I, I don't know, you know, um, and then in one version of the script, Lex is straight up Kryptonian. And then later it's changed to where he finds a Kryptonian uh, like pro pod soldier when he's younger and gets knowledge. And that's how he builds Lex core. He's been searching for Cal. I don't like it. Um, I just, yeah, I, uh, and like they really did this whole big shtick on the Kryptonian city of Mena and the religion and the Holy land. And I'm like, what is this? Like, it just was such a huge departure that I did not like it at all. I'm going to stop talking and let you talk. <laughs> no, I mean, I think you and I are on the same page with this. I, I was not taken with these departures. It's funny because there are a lot of aspects of this origin story that, that are traditional and oh, maybe almost to its detriment. You know, you, you get, again, at least in the version that I heard brought to life in this radio play, you know, the Kent's finding baby Kal-El and raising him as Clark and, and all of that. And, uh, Clark starting work at the Daily Planet. We meet the traditional Daily Planet cast of Lois and Perry and Jimmy. So there are a lot of aspects. He makes his debut as Superman, catching Air Force One and landing it in a baseball field, which of course we would get later in Superman Returns. So, you know, I think there are a lot of aspects that people would be familiar with, but where it does deviate from the established canon, it it really is, in a lot of respects, antithetical to what we understand to be Superman. Now, in fairness, it did it did prompt some reflection on my part where I said to myself, okay, what, especially when we talk about the origin story in this mythology, like what aspects of it are so sacrosanct that if we mess with it, we are undermining the story here? And I think for most of us, the idea of him escaping his doomed planet <laughs> is so baked into what this character is that keeping Krypton around really does a disservice to the story. Now, playing devil's advocate, I said to myself, well, does this still work if the planet, as depicted in, in Flyby, the planet is, isn't destroyed, but it is ravaged by civil war, and it's not tenable for Kal-El to remain there? Like, that aspect of it, really getting to the most fundamental idea here, like, he can't stay on Krypton. So, you know, that piece of it is still there, but by keeping the planet around, I asked myself, what what are we gaining from this? What is the point of this? Because later on in the story, like you said, you do get this battle between uh, Kal-El and Tizor, son of, of uh, Jor-El's brother. And now in the version that I heard, it was just Tizor. I know in other versions, it was yeah. multiple Kryptonians he was battling. But, you know, we've seen in Superman 2, in Man of Steel, you know, we've seen battles between Superman and other Kryptonians via the Phantom Zone, right? So as... Near as I can tell, the the only real value in keeping Krypton around is the ending. You know, Flyby ends on this cliffhanger of Kal-El going back to help his home planet. You know, so I feel like that's the only thing that you really get out of this. And look, we don't know where the story would have gone. Maybe it would have been an amazing story. I don't know. But within the context of this, I think you lose far more than you gain from it. So I just think this was a, a huge miscalculation on JJ Abrams part. I, I agree. Like I, it's interesting. Like we were talking about how, if you look at the spectrum of Superman projects, trying to get it going and you start with uh, something that's in the vein of the comics with like the death of Superman, the Nick Cage film. 
And then they go here and it's such a radical change that then they try to play it safe by going back to the Chris Reed with Brian Singer, which, you know, it has, it, I have read that it was, see, now I can't remember if it, Ratner or McGee that actually had storyboarded and had all the action and storyboards and beats done for that plane scene that they then incorporated it into Superman Returns because they already had this huge action set piece. And for all we know, they had the, the sets built. I mean, they were building different things for this. Um, and then it became Superman Returns. You know, they ended up filming Superman Returns in Australia and everything. So it's very crazy all the shuffling that happened. I do want to point out before we talk more is two actors who did audition for flyby. Um, one being Brandon Ralph. He did audition. He's in, he's in like the makeup mock-up costume for flyby and Henry Cavill <laughs> both auditioned. And then Brandon Ralph talked before and he got, you know, to audition for Superman he got called back, but when he got called back, it was for Brian Singer. Um, and not, so could you imagine that you're auditioning for one movie, but then you realize you're auditioning for another movie with the same character for a new director. I'm like, that would be a very interesting experience. I know for sure. Yeah. I, I, I saw the, uh, the Henry Cavill photo uh, of him from his screen test. Yeah. It's funny. I mean, I think these guys, you know, they, they get on a list and it's, you know, typically, uh, again, a lot of the known actors of the day who were popular, who had the, you know, the essential look of the character who would, you know, were always rumored to be in the mix. And then, yeah, up and comers like those guys who uh, who are on the list as well. I mean, it's it's funny, especially with Henry Cavill. I mean, we're talking 10 years later that he would actually play the character. So uh, it definitely would have been a young, young. younger. So, yeah, very young Superman. This would have been at time of... Count of Monte Cristo, I think, right around there. If you remember, he plays Albert, um, Edmund Dantes' son. So Superman is playing Jesus' son. <laughs> <laughs> um, I didn't know that was him for the longest time, but that was one of his first acting roles. So that gives you an idea of that his youthful look. Now, this script and the, the audio drama... How did it make you feel? Because when I was listening to it, it made me feel like I was watching or listening to like a Superman version of The Office. Because there was so much of like personal narration, personal description and talking. I could just picture like action in the background and Lois Lane looking at the camera talking to me. Or <laughs> there's so much voiceover. I was like, it, it just felt weird. I mean, to be honest with you, it just... Like you have Martha, you have Jonathan, you have Lex. Um, Lex is working on his software. The it's Luthorian, or Luthorian's the company, not LexCorp or LutherCorp. It's like Luthorian, and his uh, what was his? He was making like lithium or something. I mean, in the version that I heard, it was it, like the the chip or the battery that's in everyone's cell phones. And he was using that to spy on people. That's what yeah. was initially, you know, attempting to expose him for. But yeah, I, I hate even message you because I, I did not read the screenplay itself. I was listening and I said to you, I was like, you know, or does the screenplay utilize the voiceovers to the extent that the audio drama does? I, I think this, this might've been a device used by new verse creative to, 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 to sort of tell the story because they are ultimately adapting it from the screenplay. So I, I think, or, but I don't know, have you taken a look at the screenplay? Do they do it? They, I looked at one and there really isn't much, but the way there's so much stuff that's put in the description of between sets, like when you're reading about how much detail is in the description of the action scenes, the transitions that I feel like it was more of a device they were trying to use to adapt to get the information out there since it is audio and there's, we don't have the visual element. Cause I was thinking like, there's no way that this would actually be in the movie like this, or that'd be a lot of voiceover. Cause it, and it just felt really, really weird. <laughs> um, 
I'm going through my notes here. Some other casting was they wanted Anthony Hopkins as Jarrell and Rafe Fiennes as Lex Luthor when Brett Ratner had come on board because those were people he had worked with on Red Dragon. Um, James Marston did meet with Brett Ratner at one point before everything. Uh, let's see. Good old Richard White. <laughs> oh, my God. Shia LaBeouf was approached by G for Jimmy Olsen. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, you talk about the back and forth with directors. So I think this was in that 10-minute documentary that I saw on YouTube that when G was set to direct the... And you had mentioned this earlier that you, you thought the script was supposed to be handed off at some point. I, I think that documentary talked about how G was going to have Josh Schwartz, creator of the OC, which G was a producer on, pen a new draft of the script. And I think that at the time, some of the, some of the OC actors were sort of in McGee's mind. Uh, the one in particular was Michael Cassidy, who played yep. Zach in season two of, of the OC. So yeah, I know I, I, a lot of what ifs. And especially when we talk about the casting, since this was so, this was all so preliminary, you know, a lot of, a lot of different names in the mix there. Michael Cassidy, who would later go on to be, you know, Grant Gabriel slash Julian Luther. And yeah. then, Jimmy Olsen <laughs> in BVS. That's right. His short lived, but he was there. And in the ultimate <laughs> cut more so. Um, I like Michael Cassidy. So when I saw him pop up, I was like, sweet. Oh, dang. <laughs> like, you know, I love Michael Cassidy. I, I enjoyed him on Smallville. I really liked him on the OC. I got to tell you, though, so not, not just, just a quick tangent, but Melinda Clark and Rachel Bilson from the OC, they've been doing their Welcome to the OC Bitches OC Rewatch podcast. And they've had Michael Cassidy on a couple of times as a guest talking about his episodes. And he is so funny. Like he was, so, he's been their best guest. So I'm primarily a fan of Michael Cassidy now, I think from his appearance on the, uh, on the podcast, he's been great. And I, I love that guy. <laughs> did you ever see his show on TBS minute work? I did. I did too. I feel like I was the only person who ever watched that show. I don't I, think there were a lot of us, but I did watch. I did watch. Um, so that's, that's when I, uh, <laughs> place i know him from he that was a great so oh, it's just interesting because you know josh hardnett was one that came up and was like a front runner and so was jared padalecki and i kind of see it but i told my buddy i said hardnett is a great actor but for superman he wouldn't work because in his eyes he doesn't have the face the eyes of superman they're more intense they don't have the softness that you need for Superman. He would work great as a Kryptonian villain. Um, but I mean, all in all, the whole Tizor, okay, we're talking about casting, was actually being cast, and the front runner who had been cast at one point for one of the directors was um Joel Edgerton. Oh, yeah, that's right. I I I, I blinked for a second, but yeah, Joel Edgerton. Um, who would go on to be Ben, or uh, not Ben, um, Uncle Owen in Star Wars, in Revenge of the Sith, and in the Clone Wars, and then now the Obi-Wan Kenobi series. He's done a lot of other stuff too, but that's that's the nerd side. He did. Uh, did you ever see Warrior? I did, with Tom Hardy. Yeah. yeah. That was a good movie. Yeah. That was very under the radar, underappreciated. Yes. I had a buddy of mine from law school for years was always on me to watch the movie. And I, I eventually did one day on my iPad on the train. And I was like, all right, let me finally watch this. And it was really good. It was. Yeah. It was, yeah. I think I watched it on my iPad at, like at work because it was one of those. I was like, okay. Like when I was working at a call center, we wouldn't get any calls for a while at night. So I'd pull up the iPad and watch something waiting. But you know, this, the script, I think one of the most interesting parts in the script that I actually did like is how Clark kind of first meets Lois. Yeah, that was interesting. This whole meeting outside of a of a college frat party where the, the, a little bit of an age difference here. So Clark is a senior in college, undeclared, uh, which they talk about in conversation. And Lois is a high school senior uh, there checking out the school with one of her friends. And so they have this this little meeting outside and and she... 
points Clark in the right direction, right? She talks about her aspirations to be a journalist and that lights a bit of a fire under him. And he eventually ends up with the daily planet. I, yeah, I, I like that. I like that well enough. But I liked it because I liked the idea of he meets her at a young point and she actually inspires him. Um, and then you have the kind of this humorous scene later where they get back together. Like when he's at the daily planet, he's, it's the feeling of he wants to tell her he's Superman, but she's not going for it. Like she thinks he's trying to tell her that he's attracted to her. And it just kind of plays that awkwardness where she's like, Oh Clark, no, I'm not dating. It's not just you. Seriously. Like, and it's funny because she's like, if you would maybe get LASIK, you know, get rid of the classes and do something with your hair, you know, you're not bad looking all this. Like, it it was it was a good scene. I would love to see actually acted out because I felt Lois was written really well. Um, how did you feel about the Jonathan Kent death? Didn't care for it. Didn't care for it. I, I you know look. I know. <laughs> I know when we talk about Jonathan Kent dying on screen, a lot of us, especially recently, we go to. Uh, the Kevin Costner version in Man of Steel. And I know there was a lot of frustration among the audience with how that played out. But here, well, man, this really, this really bugged me where he dies off screen. He dies off screen. And we find out that he was listening to the radio and heard about Clark making his debut as Superman and was so excited as he ran in to tell Martha about it. He had, he had a heart attack. <laughs> I, I, I'll say this. I, at least he was so excited to hear about Clark. I thought initially this was going in the direction. He was just scared for Clark and he died. Yeah. But either way, it puts this huge, this huge guilt on Clark so much so that he's not even sure if he wants to be Superman again. I, but the fact that it happens off screen and you don't get any sort of farewell moment between them. I thought that was such an odd choice, man. I, it definitely felt like a first draft, kind of just, we'll put this here, I'll come back to it kind of thing. Maybe. It really did feel like we'll we'll really find the moment, you know, as we go back and revise the script. Because to me, I'm like, that just, there's no dramatic tension, and there's nothing. And, you know, my biggest thing with the whole Kevin Costner death was, look, I watched 10 years of Smallville. I know Clark can run fast. He could have very easily ran, grabbed his dad, ran through the hurricane or the twister tornado and ran back around and had, you know, before anyone knew what happened. And that's the thing. I, and I, I you know, I don't want to go on a huge tangent with it because I've talked about this a lot on digging for kryptonite. I, I think that I, I can appreciate the intent of the scene and the intent that Jonathan would rather die than have his son reveal himself to the world at this point in time, because the world isn't ready. So I can, I can look past a lot, but I do agree. I think in the execution of it, whether it was just the staging or the setup, whatever the case may be, it's hard as an audience member. And especially as Superman fans to sit there and not say exactly what you just did. It's like, well, just do it at super speed. No one will even see. I think there needed to be something else set up in that scene to account for why the only way for Clark to do this would be to reveal himself. And people would still have problems with it because they would still say, well, he still shouldn't let his father die. Fair enough. But I think that would have gone a long way if, if it were clearer that he really only had the choice of letting him die or revealing himself. Cause I think that's, that's ultimately the tension. That's the intent of that scene. And it, it ties into the central theme of the movie. So I think it works in a lot of ways, but yes, the way it plays out, it's hard not to feel frustrated. I get it. But all in all, you know, there's, like I said, we, we kind of wrap up here with fly by because I didn't like it. I mean, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time going on. I do want to talk about it just because it is one of those pieces. And I think next year in 2023, I'm going to, do an episode where I'll really break down and go into a little bit more details on Justice League uh, Mortal. Cause that's the other major pro pro uh, project that had substance to it. You know, with the script, the casting, the start of production, all that. But all that to come back to, I do like Superman Returns. There's a lot of good in it. There's things I wish it that would have been different. But I don't think I would have liked this. I think... 
Had it come out, I would have enjoyed, I would have enjoyed it for spectacle. I would have enjoyed it just for having something. But then when I really sat back, I think I would have been very disappointed and, and hurt and upset. And, you know, I usually try not to allow these things to get to me too much, but I think this one really would have bothered me and stuck with me because it is so much of a departure from just who the character is, his origin. It's not like you're just, you're tweaking little things, you know, like Krypton blew up because of Brainiac or Krypton blew up because of their own um, piety. Okay. In the end, Krypton still blew up. So, you know, you're, you're tweaking why it blew up or Krypton was, you know, Blew up because of Rogel's art. You know what? It's so funny you say that because I, ha- I was going through the same calculus earlier. And when I was asking myself those questions of what is so central to this story and what can be changed. And I talked about how I was not a fan of the Rogel's are aspect introduced by Brian Michael Bendis in his run. But at the end of the day, yes, regardless of what's ultimately responsible for Krypton's destru- destruction, Krypton is destroyed. It'd be like if you told a Batman origin story and the Waynes lived. You know, it's just like, how does this, how does this work? This is just undermining the the core of this origin story. It's, it's, I think it's very tough. I think it's very tough to get past. So I, I, I'm with you. I don't, I don't look at this and say, oh, I wish we could have seen this. Whereas I will say, and I have said that I, I, you know, I wish we could have seen Superman lives. At the same time, I would not necessarily want Superman Lives at the expense of Superman Returns or the Snyderverse. And if getting Superman Lives means butterfly effect, we don't get any of those other movies, then I'll, I'll keep what we got. But if there's some universe where we could have seen Superman Lives and then Superman Returns still would have come out as it did, I would love to see because I, I think there was a lot there that was interesting, but that didn't fundamentally shatter the Superman story. And I, I was like, man, it would have been a little weird, a little offbeat, but it's like, eh, you know, eh, it would be kind of cool to see. I don't really feel that way about this one. So, yeah. I, you know, I think it's, uh, um, I, I'm with you. I think if, if they ever did an animated adaptation or something like that, or a comic book adaptation, that could be cool to see. I would prefer that they did Superman lives first. And it's baffling to me that they haven't. It's so crazy to me, but I feel like yeah, that's, that's an untapped uh, market. I've, I've said that for a long time. Like, I feel like they did direct to HBO or direct to video at like one, like for a while, you know, how they did like the return of the Cape crusader. Yeah. 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 Animated film. If they did like unproduced scripts as animated films, because there's some very talented voice actors that can sound like the actors that had originally supposed to be cast. I think that would be a immense, just well of what ifs that people could sit back and think, Oh man, that was cool. But no, I, I'm with you. I just, I get the idea of wanting to do something different with this. And they went, I'm kind of curious about if you were to approach JJ now and were to like, Hey, what would you do for Superman now? Where he would come from? If he still would want to do this or if he had a different idea, but fly by just does not work for me. It's a fly no. It's a you know, hold the nose down. So well said. And, you know, they also, I know you had mentioned this earlier when you gave your, your, your breakdown of the whole thing, but they do cram in an aspect of the death of Superman, i.e. Tizor killed mm-hmm. Superman. And it's this Kryptonian afterlife reunion between Kal-El and Jor-El, who has just committed suicide in the Kryptonian prison that he's in, that is, is able to revive Superman. So he's only dead for like a few minutes the way it plays out. So that's the other thing too, at least in the Tim Burton movie, you got a battle with doomsday. Yeah. It was, it was, you know, far more faithful to the source material. And, and I'll I'll say this in closing, I'm not generally speaking, I, I don't feel like this slavish devotion to, to the source material is the only way forward. And I think especially in an adaptation, there have to be some liberties and you have to find some new angle and, and a way to present the material that in theory will be appealing to the mass audiences. But this just felt too far. And, and again, I just don't know what, what value you really get out of this other than again, being able to set up the return to Krypton, which they do at the end of this movie, but there are other ways to achieve the same result. And well, you and I will be talking on, on my podcast next year about, about New Krypton. And we've seen yeah. the New Krypton story where there's this lost colony 
whether it's Candor or otherwise, of Krypton that's out there. So there are ways to still, I think, achieve the same effect without blowing up the origin story, which this movie does. So I fly no for me as well. Yeah, I can't say it much more than that. We could spitball for a while on what could have been or what should have been. But that's why I said I don't want to spend a whole lot more time because it's not fascinating and exciting in, like, the good. It's very much more, like, fascinating of the bad with just some of the choices. But Well, look, it didn't get made. And I know there was a lot. Again, this movie was in development hell. There was a lot of back and forth, changing out of people. I think... uh I even forget at this point whether it was, I think it was Ratner who was having clashes with producer John Peters. So there was a lot that. Everybody has there. clashes with producer John Peters. <laughs> Every, yeah. But I think too, you know, maybe even, even putting all of that political maneuvering aside, I, I think just looking at this, there's a reason why it didn't get made. And, and maybe even if those other stars had aligned, maybe this still would not have gotten off the ground. I, I don't think this was where it needed to be creatively. So Again, it's it, I, I again. It's, I don't think it's any great loss, and uh, I, I'm with you. I think that's pretty much all I have to say on the subject. Well, Anthony, thanks for being here. Uh, where can people find you? Thank you. No, I appreciate it. So, digging for kryptonite is my main Superman podcast, available on all major podcast platforms. And if you are a fan of the George Reeves Adventures of Superman television series, I also have a rewatch podcast of that called Another Exciting Episode in the Adventures of Superman. Uh, And that, too, is available on all major podcast platforms. You have been a guest on both shows. I really appreciate that. And uh, I have even more podcasts and documentary projects. If you go to flatsquirrelproductions.com, everything is listed there. And uh, I hope people will will check out some of those projects. I appreciate it. Um, I I will say that looking forward to January for the return of the Summoning the Zords. The George Reeves has been great to watch along with the podcast. It really helped. I'm hoping as the podcast goes on that maybe mm-hmm. it'll show up on a streamer. I mean, some one of them, Tubi, come on, help us out here. You know what, Tubi? I mean, Tubi has Superboy now. I think there's a far better chance of the George Reeve show showing up on Tubi than on HBO Max, to be perfectly honest at this point. So I agree with you. I mean, I, if I remember, Tubi has Batman 66, I think, and it has the the Stamp Day special for George Reeves as well, so... Yeah. I mean, we're doing well so far. We're only, you know, five episodes out at this point. We're doing well, but I really feel like the numbers would shoot up if we, if the show were actually available that we're discussing. So I, I would love for that to happen. That's what happened to uh, Always Hold On to Smallville when Zach was, you know, doing the podcast. And then when it got on Hulu, you definitely saw more interaction and everything changed. Yeah. But all right, man, take care. Thanks for being here. And remember... Look up in the sky. We just want to say, if you've enjoyed this podcast, please check out other podcasts on the Press Play Podcast Network. 